Peace like a river. It's nice when you can get it. It's nice when you can find it. When you don't have it, you'll do almost anything to get it. You almost become crazed to find it. There was a, uh, a peace treaty that was signed towards the end of World War I on the Eastern Front between Russia and Germany. Germany had, had done a pretty good job of inflicting a large number of casualties on Russia. Russia wasn't in the best state to begin with when the war started. And they were in the throes of a revolution. The Soviet Union was beginning to take over in Russia at the time. And they were eager to secure their peace inside the country and outside the country. So they went to the bargaining table with Germany and said, what do we got to do to end this war? And Germany exacted a heavy price tag. Large amounts of territory was taken from Russia and Vladimir Lenin and the other Soviets happily signed it over so that they could concentrate on having internal peace. And this peace treaty that was signed sowed great amount of discord. The allies on the Western Front felt horribly betrayed. And almost more than any other peace treaty, and almost more than any other agreement, it sowed the seeds of the conflict that would take place right around when this church was founded in 1939. It was an uneasy peace that was signed that day. It wasn't a peace that anybody could be proud of, except for maybe Germany. Nobody was happy with it. Oftentimes we make peace in the midst of difficult circumstances because we just want things to be quiet. We just want things to be easy. And we wind up making concessions and we wind up making peace treaties that we're not proud of. Peace with other people, peace with ourselves, maybe even an apparent peace with the Lord. We think he's just mildly displeased with us, but if we can just make him happy by doing one more good thing or one more nice thing, we'll have peace. Today I want to talk about how we can have peace that we can be proud of. Peace that we can be proud of. We're going to be in Philippians chapter 4, verses 1 to 7. And I want us to look at the position of the peaceful, the perception of the peaceful, and the prayers of the peaceful. So let's look at the position of the peaceful. Verse 1. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. My goodness, Paul loves him some Philippians. Man, this dude has a huge crush on the people at Philippi. I wish people would talk to me the way that Paul talks to the Philippians. That'd be so nice. Look at it. Whom I love and long for, my brothers, my beloved. Goodness gracious. That's romance right there. He calls them his joy and his crown. Now what he means by this is that he's proud of them. All the work, all the effort that Paul has put into being an evangelist, being a missionary, being a pastor, Philippi is like the crown jewel. He's proud of them. He wants them to keep going. Now, when you have something that you're proud of, you want to display it prominently, right, in your home, whether it's an award, it's a trophy, it's a diploma, and you want to display it in a way that's secure, it's not going to fall. So if you have a diploma that you want to hang, don't get me to hang it, because it won't be secure. If you have toddlers in your house, nothing is secure. It does not matter how high it goes, it is not secure. And Paul's looking at these believers and he's saying, I want you to be secure. And that's why he tells them in verse one, stand firm in the Lord. He wants them to be secure. He wants them to be safe because he's so proud of them. He wants them to keep going. He wants them to keep enduring. And so he wants them to stand firm. The word stand firm means to be firmly committed in conviction or belief. Firmly committed in conviction or belief. It's used numerous times throughout Paul's letters. And it usually is used with the idea that someone is committed to the gospel. That they may have to give up their life. They may have to give up their property. They may have to give up relationships. But they're never going to ever give up on the gospel. And this is one of the reasons why I think we lack peace in our own lives. This is one of the reasons why we lack peace. Because we identify everything else as non-negotiables and the gospel winds up being the first thing that we're willing to run out on. You see, when you're defending in, in a military engagement, when you're defending in a strategy, typically you wanna have a prepared defense. And what this means is, before the bullets start flying, you kind of look at the ground, you look at the lay of the land, and you say, okay, we're going to dig in here, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, we're going to uh, we're gonna put the supplies here, all that stuff. You don't want to wait until there's an attack to get ready for it. 
And what many of us do is we wait till things get hairy, we wait till we lose our peace, we wait till we get anxious about everything, and then we turn to the gospel. Then we turn to the Lord and we're like, oh Lord Jesus, help me. And we wonder why he's quiet or we wonder why we can't find him. Have you ever tried to find your keys when you're late? It's impossible. It's like they magically disappear. Why? You're like frenetic. And so we wait to find the Lord until we're in a position where we're anxious, panicked. Our peace is already gone. Many of us make the mistake of not making the gospel our fortress in the midst of peaceful times. One of the major issues with the treaty that I talked about as our time began was the environment in which it was signed in. The Russians just wanted the shooting to stop, not because they were, were tired of people dying, but because the Soviets needed peace so that they could secure the internal conflict that was going on. The war did just enough to push the imperial government over the edge, and now they wanted to seize control. The Germans went with the demands that they went with because they had sacrificed millions of lives and they had to justify it to their people. And the only way to justify that was to say, look how much territory, look how many concessions we got from these people. The environment in which you make peace has a tendency to show, to reveal what kind of peace you will have. True lasting peace was impossible then. It's impossible now if you do not have solid ground from which to operate. If your hope, if your joy, if your security, if your crown is anything other than the gospel, if it's your job, if it's your health, if it's your athleticism, if it's your intelligence, if it's your beauty, if it's your wealth, whatever it is, if it's anything other than that, then that's gonna be your hill to die on. That's gonna be the thing you can't lose and you will sacrifice everything for it. If it's your family, It'll be about defending that one thing. Rather than standing firm in the Lord, you will try to stand firm in that one thing and it will not work. It will let you down every time. Because it's not a strong position. It's not a strong position. And so in order for the gospel to be our place of peace, for it to be our fortress, we gotta actually do some work. Just like a soldier has to dig in and use a spade before he uses a gun, We've got to do some digging. And so the first thing we need to do is we need to actually know what the gospel is. And many of us in this room would say we know what it is, I would hope, especially if you grew up in the church. But I think we, we make it too narrow. A lot of us would say the gospel is Jesus Christ crucified, buried, and resurrected. And that's true, but it's incomplete. Because there's a whole bunch of scripture outside of that story that points to the gospel. The gospel is a large narrative, it's a large story. God created the heavens and the earth and he made a good creation, that's chapter one. And then chapter two is man rejects God. Human beings reject God because we value autonomy, we value independence over the love and affection of our savior. But God doesn't just cast us out. Instead he works to redeem us, to rescue us. And so the rest of the story of the, of the scriptures is God's efforts to rescue and redeem his people. He gives the law to Israel. He doesn't give the law to Israel so that they will be redeemed. He gives the law to Israel to show them, one, how to interact with them, but two, to show them they can't do it, that they can't save themselves. They do such a bad job of it, they're exiled, they're scattered, and we'll talk about this later. And then the Son of God shows up puts on flesh, dwells amongst men, and then he's crucified, then he's buried, then he's resurrected. And the church is founded. The New Testament church is founded. And then Christ returns, Christ will return one day for us, and that's chapter four. The entire gospel is that narrative. You can't just limit it to Jesus crucified, buried, resurrected. It's not that small. And this is why we have a hard time applying the gospel to our lives. It's because we see this as a narrow story, a limited story, and we don't see how the gospel pertains to the rest of our lives. So it's why we look at the gospel as, oh, I believed that when I was young, I got baptized, now I'm ready to move on to meatier things. Just like Caleb told you to, to think about meatier things after, for lunch today. I wanna move on to meatier things. I wanna, I wanna dig in deep to the, there's nothing deeper than the gospel. And so we've gotta to learn to apply it to our lives. That's the second part, the second application we have to do. 
It's more than just Sunday mornings. The gospel tells you how to be a good parent, tells you how to be a good employee, how to be a good employer. It tells you how to follow the Lord, not just as an example, but when you begin to apply it. Think about this. Many of you work in industries and in jobs where you're asked to be creative. Why are we creative? Because our creator made us in his image. And when he makes us in his image, the only thing we know about God at that point is that he's creative. And so we're made to be creators. When you view the gospel this way, when you reach out to someone and and you you seek forgiveness or, or, or you need to apologize for something and they reject you, if the gospel is the fortress of your life, you don't get angry, you don't get hurt. What happens is you try again and you try again and you try again. You know why? Because the story of the gospel is God reaching out again and again and again to his enemies to rescue and redeem them. When you view the gospel this way, when you fail, and you will fail, you don't become sullen. You don't run away from the Lord. Instead, you come back to him and you say, Lord Jesus, I failed. I let you down. I, 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 I built an idol. I did a thing. I did the thing that I did all the, do all the time. I, and Jesus responds to you, I know and I forgive you come back. When the gospel is central to your life and your peace is disrupted, whatever peace that might be, you don't despair. You know why? Because you know that peace is temporary until the Lord returns and then it's eternal. This is why when you come to the Bible, everything you read, you have to ask one question. How does this apply? How does the gospel apply to my life? How, does the, I get, how do I get to the gospel from this story? How does this point me to Jesus Christ? There's nothing stronger than the gospel. If you negotiate the trials of life, with the gospel is your firm foundation, then you will always have a posture of peace. You'll be a person of peace because the Prince of Peace will be central to your life and his story will be central to your life. But it's not enough just to have a posture of peace, to have a place to stand firm from. We also have to have a new perception of peace. The perception of the peaceful. Verse two, I entreat Euodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Now, Paul does something he never does here. He names names, which is Baptist and our love of gossip. We're like, ooh, go on. Of course, he has to give them, of course, their names are incredibly difficult to pronounce. If you want fun YouTube, type in Syntyche and see how to pronounce it, and you'll get like seven different answers. It's pretty funny. These women are disagreeing. Now, sometimes people look at this and they're like, oh, there goes women again, being catty and disagreeing. That's awful. That's not true. These women are probably leaders in the church. And why do we think they're leaders in the church? Well, one, they're named by name, which is usually a good sign. But if you know anything about Philippi, Philippi was founded by women. The the, the Philippian church was founded by women. Paul goes to Philippi, he sees women praying by the river, and he starts a church with Lydia and probably Euodia and Syntyche, some others. And Paul, they're disagreeing about something. Probably what they're disagreeing about is ministry. They're disagreeing about the direction of the church, which is something we never do now. (laughs) Never happens. And what this tells you is what they're disagreeing about is probably incredibly important. It's about the gospel, it's about ministry, it's about evangelism. And those are all things worth striving for, but let me tell you this, at the end of the day, those things are trivial. Now hold on, Travis, did you just say that evangelism is trivial? Did you just say, let me get there, let's let's unpack this. Let's unpack this. Because for many of us, our perception of peace is negative. Our perception of peace is negative. Many of us believe that to give or to compromise or to negotiate, we've already lost. We wanna have it all our own way all the time. We think every hill is the gospel. We don't have one fortress that is the gospel. We view everything as the gospel. We try to make it a fortress. Everything is core. There are no negotiables. We use words like there's a slippery slope. We deliver ultimatums. If you do this decision, I'm gonna leave or I'm gonna break my friendship with you. And it becomes a power struggle because what we do is we link everything and we say that everything is the gospel. So we equate peace with weakness, with losing, and with resignation. On the other hand, the flip side of this is 
what happens to us internally. That's what happens externally. But internally, if you view everything as important, everything is vital, you won't be able to say no to anything. And you'll juggle plates. You'll, your life will be about keeping plates in the air. You'll work ridiculous, insane hours. You'll say yes to everybody because you think everything's important. The Greek word that's used most often in the Bible when it's talking about anxiety is the word, and it means divided. The word means divided. And many of us are divided. You got plates spinning over here, plates spinning over there, trying to keep everything alive. And when you're chopped up like this, when your life's chopped up like this, you'll never be good enough. You'll never be perfect. You'll never be peaceful. You'll only see places you're failing. And you can never be whole. Because that's what the biblical perspective of peace is. The Hebrew word for peace is shalom. You've probably heard that word before. It actually means wholeness. The gospel is a story of, of God coming to bring a fractured, scattered, anxious people back together and give them wholeness. So I'm gonna go back to what I said was trivial. Evangelism is trivial. If the people that are preaching the gospel are divided. The biblical perception of peace is shalom, wholeness for everybody. That's the message. Jesus Christ was crucified, buried, resurrected, and is coming again. Why? So that you can have wholeness. So that the scattered pieces of your life can be brought into some sort of semblance of order. And when a divided church comes to a broken world and says, hey, we have the answer, that's, why, that's when evangelism becomes trivial. Because we fight and we argue over the most ridiculous things. Disunity can never be a pathway to unity. It won't ever happen. So we have to be unified. We have to come together. Doesn't mean uniformity. We say that a lot. But it does mean sometimes I don't get my own way. You who are fractured and struggling to win every battle in your life, you're fractured too. And that's not shalom either. It's not shalom either. So what do I do, Travis? Paul tells Euodia and Syntyche to agree in the Lord. What does that mean? How do, what do I do here? Well, first, we gotta go back to the gospel. Look at Deuteronomy 30, uh, verse one. It'll be on the screen for you if you don't wanna turn. I understand it's a lot of pages. And Deuteronomy is that place we're all afraid of. There's that three, those three books of the Bible where we get scared. Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy are like, I don't wanna go there. <laughs> verse one, and when all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse, this is God talking, which I have set before you, and you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God has driven you, and return to the Lord your God, you and your children, and obey his voice in all that I command you today, with all your heart and with all your soul. Then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have mercy on you, and he will gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. If you're outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there the Lord your God will gather you, and from there he will take you. And the Lord your God will bring you into the land that your fathers possessed, that you may possess it, and he will make you more prosperous and numerous than your fathers. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring, so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and that you may live. Let me tell you what's happening here. God's telling the, the people of Israel what's going to happen if they obey and what's going to happen if they disobey. And he comes to the end of it all and he says, look, there's going to come a point where you'll disobey and there'll come a point where I will scatter you across the earth. And this is what happens. They go into exile. And God says, if you return to me, if you confess and repent and return to me, I will bring you back. I will take you from being fractured and scattered and I will give you shalom. I'll give you wholeness yet again. And then he says something really cool. The best part's in verse 6. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and that you may live. What does that mean, circumcise the heart? Paul tells us in Romans 2.29 that the spirit of God, when we come to know Christ, when we surrender, when we confess and repent to him, he circumcises our hearts. He gives us the ability to respond to him. He takes dead hearts and he makes them alive again. You see, wholeness, peace, is not won by doing more, by not fighting harder. Our Savior shows us that. 
All of us are afraid to, to make peace. One of the reasons why I think we're afraid is because we don't want to be a doormat. We don't want to get run over. Well, I just don't want to be a doormat for people, Travis. You're, the greatest peace that has ever been won, eternal peace with God and with other people through Jesus Christ's death, death and resurrection, was won by the king of the universe being a doormat. Let that sink in. Jesus is the most powerful person to ever live. And he let himself be killed. He was a doormat. Why do we think we're above that? Why do we think that doesn't apply to us? Why do we scorn the doormat? He did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. And yet here we are, afraid to apologize to somebody else because we don't want to get run over. We're afraid to be on the, the, the short end of a negotiation because we don't want to be a doormat. To have shalom, you've got to have two things. First, you've got to turn to the Lord. Stop trying to win everything. You've got to stop trying to win everything. I know we're Americans, and we're Texans on top of that. Y'all are. I'm still, I'm still claiming my Georgia heritage here. We still like to win, too. Must be a human thing. Let Jesus gather the scattered parts of your life and bring them together in wholeness whether your heart and your mind is fractured because you're trying to keep up with all the things or your heart has been broken by a relationship that didn't pan out or a friendship that's broken, or maybe it's just you're trying to be the best at what you do and you're trying to climb that ladder or climb that mountain or be the, the best parent or the best husband or wife or whatever it is. Let Jesus bring back the scattered parts of your life together in wholeness and shalom to him, turn to him. And then do what, don't be afraid to do what Jesus did. Don't be afraid to lay down your life. If we're going to have a perception of peace, we have to see laying down our life as a way to acquire peace that's good for us. We think if we lose, then it's not good for us. That's not what the scriptures teach. So we've seen about the position of the peaceful. We've seen the perception of the peaceful. Let's talk about the prayers of the peaceful. Verses four to seven. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Paul gives five commands here. Four of them are what you need to do and fifth is kind of how you get there. The first two are the same, rejoice and rejoice. Joy is so important to being a follower of Christ. It is so important to be joyful. Gordon Fee points out that peace and joy are inextricably linked. And I think this is because both are found in Christ. And so many of us try to find it in other things. I try to find my joy in other things and I try to find peace in other things. And if my circumstances are good, I have peace and joy. If my circumstances are poor, I lose my peace and joy. This is where you've got to make the gospel your fortress. This is where you've got to, got to put all your hope and your trust and your faith. The gospel can't be something that you look to as a fallback option. It's everything. And the third, let your reasonableness, can also mean gentleness, be known to all. The word reasonableness means not to insist on every single word, point, jot, tittle of laws, rules, and customs. How, who are my rule followers in here? So if you're a rule follower and I ask who I'm a rule follower, you gotta put your hand up. Like that's the rules. <laughs> Come on. Right on. Right on. I saw another hand back there. Good job. Yeah, so when I play board games, my wife makes fun of me because I'm like the enforcer of rules. My reasonableness is known to no one playing board games. But I think it's interesting here that reasonableness is nestled conveniently between joy and be anxious about nothing. So if you want to be morose and you want to be anxious, the pathway, it seems to me, is insist on your way all the time. If you want to be sullen, if you want to be unhappy, and you want to be worried all the time, be a control freak. Be a control enthusiast, perhaps might be a nicer way to say that. The fourth imperative is don't be anxious for anything. The opposite of peace is anxiety. It means being divided. And he gives us a reason not to be worried. He says, the Lord is near, the Lord is at hand. Now, this obviously means the Lord is returning soon. 
There's an eschatological sort of returning. But I also think near can, or at hand can also mean close by. Don't be anxious for anything because Jesus Christ is close to us. He's close by. He's in the midst of the things that we're dealing with. He's in the midst of the things you struggle with. And that's why he gives us a fifth imperative. Make your requests known to God. Look what it says. In everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Thanksgiving and supplication together. If we're going to be people who trust in the Lord, who have a position and a, and a place of peace, a perception of peace. We've got to be people that pray in peace. And that means we've got to be thankful for what God has done and we've got to be expectant about what God will do. And so we talked about standing firm. If you want to stand firm, you've got to have a good stance. You've got to have a good solid base, right? So as a follower of Jesus Christ, you should have one foot in the past, remembering all the things that God has done and praying out of that, Lord, you've provided in the past, we need you to provide again. Lord, you've, you've given me health in the past, I need health again. But you've also got to have one foot in the future. Lord, you're coming soon. You're going to make all things right. So even if I don't have the peace I'm looking for now, I will have it in the future and I'm not going to be shaken by it. One foot in the past, one foot in the future, and that's how you have peace in the present. And so we approach God seeking this peace. And there's this truth that we forget once in our lives. We think that, well, once I have the posture of peace down and once I got the right perception of peace, then I'll start praying. That's backwards. Anxious people pray. You know, I know that I'm anxious. You've got to pray before you have the position, before you have the posture, before you have the perception. Prayer is where it starts. It's not where it ends. In fact, it's a prerequisite for knowing him. We have to admit the fact that we can't control our life. We have to admit the fact that I can't win peace on my own. And if you try, you know what you're going to wind up with? You're going to wind up with a peace treaty like the Russians and the Germans signed that just sowed the seeds for further conflict later on. You wonder why these things keep happening, why you continually have conflict with other people, why you continually get in way over your head, why you continue. It's because you keep signing peace treaties in your own strength and your own power rather than turning to the Lord. So what do you do? Well, first you need to have peace with the Lord. Seek him in prayer. Some of us don't know him. I thought peace with God for a large large part of my life was being able to answer one question well because I was a good Baptist. I was taught that if you could answer the question, well, if you died tonight and God asked you, why should I let you into my heaven, what would you say? I thought if I could answer that question, I'd get in heaven. You know what that faith is? That's faith in the answer to a test question. That's not faith in Jesus. I had faith in my ability to pass a test. I don't know what I'll say now, to be honest with you. Try not to think about it. but I know my faith is secure. I know my peace is secure. Some of you do not have that peace. You think about your eternal future and there's anxiety and fear and worry. You need to settle that. You need to turn to him, confess, repent. If you want to know how to do that, you can talk to me afterwards. I'll be right there in the back. Some of us need to have peace with other people. Jesus does this amazing thing when he's dying on the cross. People are Pointing, putting spears in his side and beating him. He says what? Forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. How many people in your life have wounded you in ways that they don't know or understand? And what you need to do is turn to the Lord and say, Lord, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. They don't know how bad they're hurting me. They don't know how bad they're hurting themselves or other people. And then some of us need to have peace in ourselves, peace with ourselves. Some of you are at war with yourself. My goodness, and the rest of us are suffering. Because you hate yourself. You loathe yourself. You don't like the way you look. You don't like the way you think. You don't like the way you talk. My God has made you beautiful. He's made you wonderful. Don't call his good work into question by hating yourself. Turn to him in gratitude for who he's made you to be, and those rough edges, those things that maybe we're not proud of, and we all have them, ask him to refine them. Ask him to work through them. But stop hating yourself. Because Jesus Christ, who probably has more right to hate all of us than any of us, loves us passionately, so much so that he died for us. You can have a posture of peace, you can have a position of peace. You have a perception of peace for sure. We've got to have prayer. We've got to turn to him and be our foundation of peace. 
it's hard talking about something so abstract. Uh, it can be difficult to get organized in your mind. So what I want to do is I want to share with you a story uh, via video of one of our own church members who found peace in the midst of a difficult, difficult season of life. You watch with me now. So our story about our daughter Annabelle is a big part of our testimony and a big part of who we are. We were pregnant and started going to the doctor's appointments and everything appeared normal. However, at about 12 weeks, my doctor suggested if we wanted to know a little bit more, we could do a blood test. And that blood test came back that she was positive for trisomy 18. We didn't know what trisomy 18 was. And of course we referred to Google and found out that most literature calls it incompatible with life. So as you can imagine, our life was crushed and we were scared and we were sad. We were extremely lost. And after seeing a specialist that confirmed the diagnosis, he recommended that we terminate the pregnancy. We wanted to continue to let God write her story. And whether that meant it would be a stillbirth or a miscarriage or we would get to meet her only for a few moments, we were ready and prepared to do that. So at the time, I was also the head volleyball coach at a local high school, and we decided very quickly to tell our coworkers and my volleyball team about the diagnosis. And in that volleyball season, I had teenage girls working together selflessly for a much bigger purpose. And we won the state championship that year, and they dedicated that whole season to Annabelle. About a month and a half later, we delivered Annabelle at Baylor Hospital. For the doctors and nurses, that was the first live trisomy 18 birth that they had experienced. And within four minutes, we heard no breathing, and then all of a sudden we heard a cry. And so we knew that she was alive, and they got her to my chest as quickly as possible. And from there, I feel every single day we were shocking doctors and nurses. They had no idea how she was even alive because she had a two-chamber heart, and they hadn't even expected her to make it two minutes. And so many people, I believe, in those days were changed and impacted by her short life. And we were able to bring her home and she died peacefully in my arms at six days old, which of course was extremely difficult. But through that entire experience, we knew in our hearts that we had done what God asked us to do, to carry her full term and to take care of her and love on her. And although her life was only six days, we are so grateful that we had her in our lives and were able to love and care for her. When God says have the faith of a child, he displayed what that looked like. Cameron prayed every day. Well, I know mom that you're saying that she may have to go to heaven, but I think she's gonna stay here for a while. And of course, when you're hearing that from your child and his faith, but then you also know that you have to be prepared if that doesn't happen. But I remember when we brought her home from the hospital, he ran out of the door with his arms open and said, I told you God would let her come home. And it's just so interesting because we're like, why did we doubt and why were we so scared when he believed and he prayed for it and he knew that it would come true? So that was amazing to see through his eyes. In 2015, Park Cities actually filmed our story and we were able to share about our daughter, Annabelle. And I so vividly remember that because I was extremely nervous about speaking about it. I was still in a very vulnerable place where I felt like I could cry at any moment and break down in the middle of the interview. And I remember when it did air at church, I know exactly where I was sitting in the back left corner and I was crying through the whole thing. And now six years later, I can say that I can sit here and confidently tell my story about hope and about love and about faith through tragedy because God has used our story to help others. And I don't think that I could have come this far if it wouldn't have been for the Park Cities community and for our family and our friends and just constantly exploring our faith and learning about God's Word. Lately, I think that when I was called to write a book and start public speaking, I was extremely overwhelmed by that call and I questioned if I would be able to do that. And I think that for me, there is peace in knowing that if I can help make an impact and share my story and help others find peace and find understanding that Annabelle's life will continue to be valuable. And I think that, especially for anyone that's lost a child, you want that child to be remembered. 
and you want people to know about them. And I think that keeping her memory alive and letting people know that even though we didn't get the miracle and her heart wasn't healed and she's not on this earth, doesn't mean that that wasn't still God's plan. We are so used to fairy tales and everything has a happy ending. Well, we still lost our daughter, but it's still beautiful because God wrote a different kind of story through us. Let's pray together. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, what a gift it is, what life is. Lord God, thank you for Annabelle, who lived for six days and lived an amazing life. A life full of love and being cherished. And now she has eternal life with you, and we're grateful. Lord, I pray that in your, your goodness and your grace today, those of us who are struggling to find peace either with ourselves or with you or with others, you would reach into our lives and you show us what that peace would look like. Centered around you. We love you. In your son's name, amen.